Good evening and welcome everyone. Passages that will be read during the narration of our music program are from the writings of Mary Baker Eddy, the discoverer and founder of Christian Science, and from the Holy Bible, King James Version. The star that looked lovingly down on the manger of our Lord lends its resplendent light to this hour, the light of truth to cheer, guide, and bless man as he reaches forth for the infant idea of divine perfection. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met to thee tonight. And the glory of Christmas is the glory of Christ. And the glory of Christmas is the story of his love. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us today. Our God, a sinner, enter in the born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. And the glory of Christmas is the glory of Christ. And the glory of Christmas is the story of his love. to human hearts the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. Oh, Christ, be welcome in. The glory of Christ and the glory of Christmas is the story of his love. Oh, the glory of Christmas is the glory of Christ. Oh, the glory of Christmas is the story of his love, the story of his love, the story of his love. And a voice from heaven seems to say, come and see. The prophets repeat, unto us a son is given. The shepherds shout, we behold the appearing of the star. And the pure in heart clap their hands. Sinner reconciled. 
ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Brings, risen with healing in his wings. Mild he lays his glory by, born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the men followed this guiding star till it came and stood over where the young child was. They bow before Christ, truth, to commune with the divine principle, love. of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again, king forever, ceasing ever, over us all to reign. Frankincense to offer have I, incense owns a deity nigh. Mirth is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes a life of gathering bloom. Glorious now, behold him arise, King and God and sacrifice. Alleluia, alleluia, earth to heaven replies. Oh, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, for he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. He hath put down the mighty from their seats, and exalted them of low degree. From the Gospel of Luke. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. From the first epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. I'm sure he must have been surprised at where this road had taken him. 
I pray that heaven's messages of on earth peace, goodwill to men may fill your hearts and leave their loving benedictions upon your lives. Mary Baker Eddy.
reach in every corner, touching every part. Make the angels music in the air tonight. Comfort all your sorrow like a your pain and sadness make your spirit whole may the peace of Christmas fill the world this night peace for every nation peace in every life heal our Thank you, Todd Peters and Jenny Lynn Stewart, for that wonderfully inspiring music. You can experience more of their brilliance at our Sunday services and Wednesday testimony meetings. Welcome to you all from the members of Third Church, New York City. We're delighted that you're here with us this Christmas Eve, whether in person or online. Before we begin, we'll take care of some housekeeping details for those here in person. Please turn off all cell phones and other electronic devices. Turn them off completely, as they will otherwise interfere with the sound system. This talk will be available in both English and Spanish, as it is this evening, for later viewing on our website 
thirdchurchnyc.com whenever you're ready for some more joyful, thought-provoking, spiritual uplift, a little more Christmas. Our speaker, Michael Muslin, comes to us from Newport Beach, California. He is a public practitioner in the healing ministry of Christian science, helping others overcome challenges through prayer. Mike has a business background of over 50 years as a leader in service industries and board member of numerous nonprofit organizations with an emphasis on advocacy for the hiring of developmentally challenged individuals. Mike has taught college-aged Sunday school classes for decades and contributes regularly to the Christian Science periodicals. Surely we can all benefit from Mike's proven expertise. Christmas is an occasion for celebrating the birth of Jesus, signifying the arrival on the human scene of the long-promised Christ. Michael Muslin's topic this evening is being drawn to the Christ. Let's join in a moment of prayerful, expectant stillness. Now, please welcome Mike Muslin. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight. And all of you on, on Zoom, uh, appreciate your tuning in. Now, I've been told that if you follow the star to either side of this room, afterwards, there's candy and cookies. <laughs> Thought I'd start with a little nativity humor. Best-selling American author Max Lucado shared this about Christmas. I love Christmas. Let the sleigh bells ring, let the carolers sing. The more Santas, the merrier. The more trees, the better. I love Christmas. The ho, 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 the rooty toot toot, the thumpity thump thump, and the ra pum, pa ra bum, <laughs> whatever. The, the pa, ra pum pum the silent night and the sugar plums. I don't complain about the crowded shops. I don't grumble at the jam-packed grocery stores. The flight is full, the restaurant's packed. Well, it's Christmas and I love Christmas. Bring on Scrooge, Cousin Eddie, and the official Red Rider carbine action 200 shot range model air rifle the tinsel and the clatter and the waking up to see what's the matter. Bing and his tunes, Macy's balloons, mistletoe kisses, Santa Claus wishes, and favorite dishes. Holiday snows, warm winter clothes, and Rudolph's red nose. I love Christmas, yet somewhere someone will ask the important Christmas questions. What's the big deal about the baby in the manger? Who was he? What does his birth have to do with me? And the questioner may be a child looking at a front yard nativity scene. He may be a soldier stationed far from home. She may be a young mom who for the first time holds a child in her arms on Christmas Eve. Christmas prompts real questions long after the guests have left and the carolers have gone home and the lights have come down. The questions remain and the promises endure. Perhaps we could all use some Christmas this Christmas, or should I say some Christ in Christmas. The origins of Christmas stem from both pagan and Roman cultures. The Romans actually celebrated two holidays in the month of December, 
The first was a two-week festival honoring their god of agriculture, Saturn. And on December 25th, they celebrated the birth of Mithra, their sun god. The English term Christmas, mass on Christmas day, is of fairly recent origin, which referred to the feast of the winter solstice. Christmas celebrated on December 25th is both a sacred religious, sacred religious holiday and a worldwide cultural and commercial phenomenon. For two millennia, people around the world have been observing it. It's also called Yule, a day a huge log is added to a bonfire around which everyone would dance and sing to awaken the sun from its long winter sleep. You know, the most probable month that Jesus was born is in the fall. Some say at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles in September or October as the most probable date of Jesus' birth, which lines up perfectly with the date of John the Baptist's birth at the Passover in March or April, six months earlier. The commercialization of Christmas is not a new phenomenon. For many centuries, Christians have battled against the commercialization of Christmas, typically winning the war only to find society gradually shifting back to pagan-like celebrations where Christmas is believed to have originated. Although the religious meaning of Christmas was long ago, shall we say, diluted, replaced with secular joys of eggnog and mall Santas. But at its core, December 25th is still a celebration of the coming of the Messiah. The Old Testament contains many passages about the Messiah, all prophecies Jesus Christ fulfilled. So tonight, let's shift from the pagan, the secular, and the commercial back to the true origin to acknowledge prophecy and the celebration of Jesus Christ's virgin birth. I divided this talk into three parts. One, Old Testament prophecy. Two, the birth story and those drawn to the manger fulfilling the prophecies. And three, how the same angels impart to each of us on our journey to find the Christ within. In other words, how we all our messengers of prophecy. And first, a little background. And I don't mean the first known Christmas celebration in Rome in 345 or the first Christmas tree in Germany in the 1500s, or President Grant's proclamation of Christmas as a national holiday in the US in 1870. By the way, that's about the same time that Christian Science, the Christian Science Church made its entry on the American scene. This story goes much further back and has quite a cast. Besides the prophets, there's shepherds and three wise men, and of course, the angel Gabriel. Besides Mary and Joseph, there's Mary, Mary's cousin Elizabeth and her husband, Zacharias, and Jesus' cousin, their son, John, who later would become John the Baptist. Our first section looks at Old Testament prophecy. Luke 24, we're going to skip ahead a little, about 33 years, if you can scroll up. We're going to jump ahead 33 years where two disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus after the advent of Christ to Luke in 24 in the King James Version of the Bible. And read about these two disciples uh, after the resurrection. If you recall, Jesus appeared and walked with them, but they did not recognize him. The Bible says their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast thou not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, 
which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Then Jesus started at the beginning with the books of Moses and went on through the, all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. Christian science affirms that Abraham, Jacob, Moses, and the prophets caught glorious glimpses of the Messiah. Mary Fairchild, a Christian writer and minister, lists 47 Old and New Testament prophecies about the birth of Jesus at learnreligions.com website. She states that some scholars believe there's as many as 300 predictions of Christ's coming. How is that possible? Multiple people over thousands of years of history were getting the same prophetic message? It's been said that prophecy is a recording of history before it happens. As Peter, Jesus' disciple, declared, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's in 2 Peter. If God made all that is made, and he knows all, it stands to reason that God is capable of communicating to all. This communication we call inspiration or divine revelation. From a spiritual or religious perspective, the belief in a divine source of prophecy explains the continuity of the prophetic messages over time. A higher power or source communicates these prophecies to individuals throughout history, ensuring the consistency of the message, despite the passage of time. But who meets the qualifications to be labeled a prophet? Certainly any individual with spiritual curiosity and who possesses the humility to listen for inspired messages. Such individuals are drawn to a new and higher thought. They have developed a spiritual sense that transcends the human or material sense of things. And this is how Christian scientists regard healing. We turn from the shadows of sickness and sin to the light of Christ. We are drawn to our own and others' natural godlike qualities, the Christ within. In contrast to the opposite picture, the material view paints of fear, lack, sickness, disease, or death. We are drawn to Christ by the same irresistible attraction with which the prophets independently and accurately communicated his coming. Through this spiritual sense, we too experience heightened receptivity to God's word. The love of Christ, which is always present, as light is always present, comes as inspiration, gently drawing thought from a false acceptance of discord to a realization of health, from fear to the calm expectation of good, from lack to abundance, and from death to life. It's as though the doors and windows of a dark room have opened up to allow the light to flood in. We can't help but turn and be drawn toward it. In the principal work on Christian science, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, the founder of our church, Mary Baker Eddy, wrote, the ancient prophets gained their foresight from a spiritual incorporeal standpoint, not by foreshadowing evil and making fact for fiction, predicting future from a groundwork of corporeality and human belief. When sufficiently advanced in science to be in harmony with the truth of being, men become seers and prophets involuntarily controlled not by demons, spirits, or demigods, but by the one spirit. It is the prerogative of the ever-present divine mind, God, and the thought which is in rapport with that mind, to know the past, the present, 
and the future. That's the end of that quote. To prophesy is to predict, reveal, or proclaim a message from God, to receive divine inspiration. It's the verb form of the message from God. In Christian science, we call these angel thoughts, God's thoughts passing to man. When multiple people over extended periods of time have the same revelation, it validates a divine utterance beyond simple human intuition or coincidence, as you will see in the specificity of the prophecies, which include the location of his birth, the year, that it would be a virgin who conceived him, the shepherds being told that they will find him in a manger, and even his name divinely revealed prior to his conception. I hope you will see, as I have, the impossibility of any other source of such specifics except as coming from divine revelation to those who were spiritually receptive. As mentioned, Christ Jesus reminded Cleopas about his coming, dating back to the earliest Bible times. Consider the following predictions. As early as Genesis, we read, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people. And from Numbers, the fourth book in the Bible, the message of one who hears the words of God, who has knowledge from the Most High, who sees a vision from the Almighty, who bows down with eyes wide open. I see him, but not there. I perceive him, but not far in the distant future. A star will rise from Jacob, a scepter will emerge from Israel. That's from the New Living Translation in Numbers. And in Deuteronomy, also from the New Living Translation, it was Moses, 1400 years before the birth of Christ, who said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites you must listen to him. In 800 BC, Isaiah revealed that familiar verse. In Isaiah 7, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Now that's a remarkable degree of accuracy. In 700 BC, Hosea said, out of Egypt I called my son, which matches God's instructions to Mary and Joseph to go to Egypt until the death of Herod. Also around 700 BC, Micah prophesied a ruler from Bethlehem when he said, but you, O Bethlehem Ephratah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel whose origins are in the distant past will come from you on my behalf. Where could Micah have come up with that specific piece of geography? Bethlehem. Okay, let's move up the calendar to around 500 BC. Gabriel tells Belteshazzar, who you may know better as Daniel, an amazing prophecy about the Messiah. This is from the New Living Translation. He correctly predicted the time that the anointed one, the Messiah, would come and bring in everlasting righteousness to confirm the prophetic vision and to anoint the most holy place. He states almost in a riddle. Now listen and understand, he says, seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Now one seven represents seven years. So 69 sevens represent 483 years. An uncanny prediction, nearly to the year of the birth of Jesus. Shortly thereafter, 
the prophet Zechariah said in the new revised standard version of the Bible. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for I will come and dwell in your midst, says the Lord. And so we see in the Old Testament the recurring theme of prophecy appearing on earth, explaining the certainty of good over evil, right over wrong, the spiritual over the flesh, and life without material limits. By contrast, the New Testament reveals the fulfillment of the messianic prophecy through the advent of Christ Jesus' virgin birth, his healing work and regenerative teaching, proving his system of healing to be the one long anticipated. As the time of the birth drew nearer, enter John the Baptist, the forerunner, and who was to prepare people for the coming of Jesus Christ. Six months older than his cousin, he preached about 30 years later, saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I have indeed baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That's in the first chapter of Mark. You know, according to mathematicians, the probability of fulfilling even a handful of these prophecies is staggeringly improbable, if not impossible. But this isn't about probabilities. Instead, it confirms a natural and resistless attraction to an all-knowing divine power we call divine mind, God. That is the only thing that explains the consistency of the prophecies and divine intervention and revelation. So now let's move to the New Testament, the fulfillment of prophecy and our second section, the birth story and those drawn by a star to the manger and to the temple in Jerusalem. The New Testament begins with four accounts of the gospel of Jesus Christ, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Of these four books, two take us through the scene of Jesus' birth. John tells us of Jesus' divine origin, the word became flesh, and Mark skips to Jesus as an adult. Matthew gives us not only Jesus' gene genealogy, but also tells the birth story from a man's point of view, that of Joseph. It's in the book of Luke that we are ushered into the holy moments surrounding Jesus' birth from a woman's point of view, that of two cousins, Mary and Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was actually Mary's aunt, the sister of Mary's mother. I will read from the first chapter of Luke, starting at verse 23 in the New Living Translation. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon after, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called 
the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea to a town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. That's from the first chapter of Luke. Now, let's add to our story the shepherds. The shepherds were the first strangers to be notified of Jesus' birth and are an important part of the nativity story. The shepherds who followed the star of Bethlehem were likely connected to the village of Bethlehem, like David, rather than the semi-nomadic variety like the Bedouin. If so, they likely would have known everyone in Bethlehem and been familiar with the community. The shepherds were living out in the fields nearby and keeping watch over their flocks at night, the Bible says, when an angel of the Lord appeared to them and said that a savior had been born in Bethlehem. Let's look at the story as written in the second chapter of Luke from the Revised Standard Version of the Bible to see what we can know about the shepherds. Starting at verse 8. Now in that same region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you, and you will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. The shepherds said one to another, Let's go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. And Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told them. Thus, the shepherds were actually the first evangelists. They saw Jesus long before the wise men, and adding to the prophecy was the naming of the child. When the eighth day came, it was time to circumcise the child. And he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. After his birth in the manger and after his circumcision in the temple, in Jerusalem eight, in Jerusalem, eight days after the birth, we return to the temple for the purification ceremony, 40 days from the birth. Enter two very brief but important visitors to the temple to see the newborn Prince of Peace, Anna and Simeon. How did they recognize the Messiah? Anna is one of the Bible's most unusual women. She was the daughter of Peniel, from whom the tribe, from the tribe of Asher, and her name, which she shares with Hannah in the Old Testament, means favor or grace. Introduced at the end of the birth narrative in Luke 1, 
Anna arrives at the purification of Mary, Joseph, and Jesus in the temple. It's a scene that is repeated over and over in the Israelite culture. For the law explained in Le Leviticus required a sacrifice of a lamb or two pigeons or two doves after a son's birth. That's in Leviticus 12. However, this purification is unlike any other. For Simon and Anna arrive at the ritual independently, though both are led by the same divine directive. Anna then approaches the Holy Family. She also recognizes Jesus as the Messiah, but she has a very different reaction from that of Mary. In Luke 37, we read that she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day, as she had been accustomed to do. And at that moment, she came and began to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Now, she's 84 years old. According to Luke, and unlike Simeon, she is not ready to die. She wants to proselytize. Like the disciples who will follow her, she is driven to bear witness to what she has seen. Mary was the first to have the good news announced to her, but Anna is the first woman to understand fully and proclaim the good news. This is because in addition to being a proselytizer, according to the second chapter of Luke, Anna is also a prophetess. In fact, she's the only woman in the New Testament explicitly described as a prophetess. Luke, who is a champion of women in the church, points out in the birth narrative that Mary is the first to be told Jesus will be the Messiah. Luke adds that she treasures the words the angel Gabriel speaks to her, but Mary, on the other hand, is puzzled by the message. She's perplexed when the angel greets her, and she must ponder the meaning of his words. In this, Mary contrasts sharply with Anna, who realizes the impact of the fulfillment of prophecy. At the temple, the family is approached by a second visitor, a man named Simeon, who's been told by the Holy Spirit that he will not die until he has seen the Messiah. The same spirit told him to go to the temple that same day. Simeon takes Jesus in his arms, praises God, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Luke may also have seen Anna as the second witness in or around the temple needed to validate Jesus. Deuteronomy 19 stresses the importance of having two witnesses to validate an event. Luke pairs Simeon and Anna, reflecting male-female parallelism when he writes about the recipients of divine blessing and salvation. The story of Jesus' birth includes two such stories, that of Elizabeth and Zechariah in Luke 1, and Anna and Simeon in Luke 2. Interestingly, in both, and typical of Luke, the women are seen as the more positive example of discipleship. The women are not only more receptive to the message, but they also are more willing to act upon it, with Elizabeth real realizing that her cousin, niece, is carrying the Messiah and praising God for this blessing, and Anna spreading the good news. Clearly, both Simeon and Anna were well-versed in biblical prophecy. They were both separately waiting for the consolation of Israel, the redemption of Jerusalem. In Luke 2, they knew it was coming because as we read, God had promised repeatedly over and over in the Old Testament, and they knew a Messiah, a savior was on the way. However, we have to remember that Simeon and Anna met a newborn Jesus they understood that they had found the Messiah even before the vast majority of the criteria for a Messiah had been met. They knew he was coming and seemed to know it would be in their lifetime. 
They may have heard that Jesus had been born in Bethlehem, and maybe even some of Mary's miraculous story. Maybe news from those shepherds and the message from the angels had reached them. They didn't see him perform a single miracle, yet they knew he was the child of promise. And now, the story of the wise men, taken from Matthew, second chapter in the King James Version. The three kings, or magi, are mentioned only in the second chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Few details are given about these men in the Bible, and most of our ideas about them actually come from tradition or speculation. Scripture does not say how many wise men there were, but it's generally assumed that there were three since they brought three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The three kings recognized Jesus Christ as the Messiah while he was still a child and traveled thousands of miles to worship him. Matthew says only that these three visitors came from the east. Scholars have speculated that they came from Persia, Arabia, or even India. They doggedly followed a star that led them to Jesus. By the time they met Jesus, he was in a house and was a child, not an infant, implying that they arrived a year or more after his birth. The gifts of the three kings symbolized Christ's identity and mission. These valuable items were standard gifts to honor a king or a deity in the ancient world. Gold is a precious metal, frankincense is perfume and incense, and myrrh as anointing oil. God warned the wise men in a dream to go home by another route and not to report back to King Herod. The three kings were among the wisest men of their time. Discovering that the Messiah was to be born, they accepted Jesus as their savior. Herod asks, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And tells them that when they find him, to return and tell him. Now the Christ is not hiding from us. When we seek the Christ with all our heart, we will find its message. In fact, it is the most intimate of relationships. These wise men paid the kind of respect only the Son of God deserves bowing before him and worshiping him. Jesus is not just a great teacher or admirable person, as many people say today, but the son of the living God. Matthew reveals nothing of these visitors' ancestry. Over the centuries, legend has assigned them names, Caspar, Melchior, and Balthasar. Balthasar has a Persian sound. If indeed these men were scholars from Persia, they would have been familiar with Daniel's prophecy about the Messiah or the Anointed One mentioned in the book of Daniel earlier. The designation of Magi refers to a Persian religious caste. But when this gospel was written, the term was loosely used for astrologers, seers, and fortune tellers. Matthew does not call them kings. That title was used later in legends about 200 AD, non-biblical sources started calling them kings, perhaps because of a prophecy in Psalm 72, may all kings bow down to him and all nations serve him. Because they followed a star, they may have been royal astronomers, advisors to kings. It's important to note that after they met Jesus, they did not go back the way they came and they did not report back to Herod. Likewise, when we receive the Christ love in our hearts, we're changed forever and cannot go back to our old life. This leads us into our final section, which addresses how we are all messengers of prophecy. God spoke to everyone I have mentioned over a period of thousands of years, and this word of God which was heard is the Christ. The human history of Jesus Christ or more accurately, Jesus the Christ. He was only 33 years old. How do, moder how do moderns deal with all this? What does it mean? Here's how Christian science sees it. 
quoting again from Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, our denominational textbook. He was the son of a virgin. The term Christ Jesus, or Jesus the Christ, to give the full and proper translation of the Greek, may be rendered Jesus the Anointed, Jesus the God crowned, or the divinely royal man, as it is said of him in the first chapter of Hebrews. Therefore God, even thy God, hath appointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And wearing in part a human form, that is, as it seemed to mortal view, being conceived by a human mother, Jesus was the mediator between spirit and the flesh. Explaining and demonstrating the way of divine science, he became the way of salvation to all who accepted his word. I mentioned that President Grant proclaimed Christmas a national holiday in 1870. A New England theologian named Mary Baker Eddy, whom I mentioned earlier, founded the Christian Science Church in 1879. She writes, today, Jew and Christian can unite in doctrine and denomination on the very basis of Jesus' words and works. The Jew believes that the Messiah, or Christ, has not yet come. The Christian believes that Christ is God. Here, Christian science intervenes, explains these doctrinal points, cancels the disagreement, and settles the question. Christ, as the true spiritual idea, is the ideal of God now and forever, here and everywhere. The Jew who believes in the first commandment is a monotheist. He has one omnipresent God. Thus the Jew unites with the Christian's doctrine that God has come and is present now and forever. The Christian who believes in the first commandment is a monotheist. Thus he virtually unites with Jews the Jews' belief in one God and recognizes that Jesus Christ is not God, as Jesus himself declared, but is the Son of God. This declaration of Jesus, understood, conflicts not at all with another of his sayings, I and my Father are one. That is, one in quality, not in quantity. As a drop of water is one with the ocean, a ray of light, one with the sun, even so God and man, Father and Son, are one in being. The scripture reads, for in him we live and move and have our being. She goes on to define Christ as the manifestation of God and Jesus as the highest human concept of the perfect man. He was inseparable from Christ, the Messiah, the divine idea of God outside the flesh. Angels announce to the wise men of old this dual appearing, and angels whisper it through, though, through faith to the hungering heart in every age. And the quote from Science and Health. Right up to that time, spiritually minded people were drawn to the Christ in the same way the shepherds, as well as Anna and Simeon, were drawn to the newborn Messiah. How does prophecy appear to us? How are we led to Christ? We never know how and when the Messiah will be revealed to us. Certainly the numerous accounts of prophets from Moses to the shepherds to the wise men validate how the spiritually minded felt the irresistible pull as clear, indisputable examples from the disciples, the early church, and right up to the 19th century founder of our church. The Bible gives us numerous proofs of men and women in earlier centuries willing to listen to the inspired voice and the revelations of God to man. We too are part of the continuing message regarding Christ's appearing. But this time it is the manger within. All of us are able to hear those angel thoughts from God and witness the birth of the pure identity of Christ in ourselves and each other fulfilling prophecy from Philippians 2, that this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is a good time to discuss salvation. Many believe that man is born a sinner and that Jesus came to save man from original sin in Genesis 2. But Christian science is a Genesis 1 religion and declares that man is the image and likeness of God 
and loved by God. However, Christian science does believe in salvation. One of our tenets of the faith, of our faith, is that man has unity with God through Christ Jesus, our way shower, and that man is saved through Christ, as demonstrated by the Galilean prophet in healing the sick and overcoming sin and death. Now, here are two examples of the Christ speaking to us, making us messengers of prophecy. The first is from an example from Emmanuel Tequila, a teenager who shared his experience in the Christian Science Sentinel in October of 2018, titled, God Spoke to Me. Pray. I was on the bus in Kinshasa, Kinshasa, on the way home from the Christian Science Sunday School when I heard this distinct message. The bus was full of people, but it wasn't a person that was telling me to pray. There didn't even seem to be a need to pray. The mood was really enjoyable. We were driving along just like on any other bus, heading toward the top of a mountain. Because of all the noise from the other passengers on the bus, I found it hard to listen to the message. Yet for a second time, and even a third, I heard the same voice telling me to pray. That's when I realized the message was coming from God. This was my first time hearing God in this way. Astonished, I asked myself, how should I start praying? I took a silent moment, and while I was doing that, I remembered a prayer that one of my former Sunday school teachers had taught me called the Daily Prayer. It's from the Manual of the Mother Church, written by Mary Baker Eddy, the discoverer and founder of Christian Science. It reads, Thy kingdom come. Let the reign of divine truth, life, and love be established in me, and rule out of me all sin. And may thy word enrich the affections of all mankind and govern them. I was in the middle of this prayer when the person closest to me on the bus shook me and told me that people were jumping out of the bus because the brakes had failed. Despite the fear and chaos of the situation, I was able to tell him that we were all safe and that there was no need to worry. God is omnipresent and was right there at that moment. I kept my thoughts on God and his kingdom, where all of us live safely. Meanwhile, the bus was going very fast, and the driver appeared to lose control of the wheel. But then something amazing happened. The driver was able to bring the bus to a stop against a culvert. Everyone, those jumping out and those staying inside the bus, was safe. From this experience, I learned to listen to God's messages. I understand better now how important it is for us to pray and pay attention to the soft but powerful voice of God speaking to each of us. Whatever we might be facing, we can be sure of God's presence and care and our ability to experience it. That's the end of Emmanuel's testimony. The second example is from my personal experience. At one time, I was president of a 250-unit restaurant chain with about 12,000 employees. At the time, dedicated employees were hard to find, so I decided to implement a new hiring program for the disabled called Hire and Hire, H-I-R-E and H-I-G-H-E-R. We hired a good number of special needs individuals under the TJTC, the government's Targeted Job Tax Credit Program. Unfortunately, only two or three months after starting their employment, they started quitting. It turned out their health care benefits, worth thousands of dollars, were eliminated as soon as their earnings went above $270 a month. I couldn't believe it. I listened for that still, small voice and the answer came, fly to Washington. Fly to Washington and start knocking on doors. Everyone told me I was crazy. I was naive and never would get in to see anyone in Washington in the bureaucracy called Congress. 
But the voice was loud and clear and came to me repeatedly to fly to Washington. I listened and obeyed. True, a lot of doors were closed, but a number were open to the idea of turning tax takers into tax payers. I felt it made sense to raise the earnings threshold from a welfare test of $270 to a social security threshold of $720 and leave their health benefits alone. After being referred to different congressmen and senators, I finally landed at a basement office of a staffer who specialized in such employment matters. I explained who I was and I laid out my ideas. He told me that, I, that the exact program I was suggesting already existed and had been sitting on his shelf for two years. Asking why, he explained that he did not have an employer willing to be a test case for the project. We then found a congressman in Texas to sponsor a two-year demonstration bill. It passed. I was informed later by the Health and Human Services Secretary, Madeline Will, that the change had led to 70,000 new jobs in the first year alone for those with developmental opportunities. The two-year project was renewed seven times and 14 later, years later was included in the permanent law as permanent law in the Americans with Disability Act. When answers appear as a direct response to listening, it's no coincidence. Here's a February 26, 1944 issue, an editorial titled, It Pays to Listen, in which a well-known Christian scientist, Paul Stark Seeley, wrote, God speaks not to one or to a few, but to every individual, yes, to you and to me, in the one real creation. Only God is speaking. His is the only voice there is to hear. As our true individuality, spiritual and perfect, is the individual expression of the life that is God, so each must individually express the speech of God, which is coincidence with this life. How often mortals plaintively cry, what shall I do? What course should I take? I'm up against a stone wall. There's no way to turn. But this isn't so. There's always a way out, and it is not a hidden pathway. God, mind, love, knows it, knows it well, and will tell you and me whenever we are willing to humbly listen for that still, small voice within. Eddie writes to all of us, so shone the pale star to the prophet shepherds, yet it traversed the night and came where in cradled obscurity lay the Bethlehem babe the human herald of Christ's truth, who would make plain to benighted understanding the way of salvation through Christ Jesus, till across a night of error should dawn the morning beams and shine the guiding star of being. Then she adds, today the watchful shepherd shouts his welcome over the new cradle of an old truth. Today the Christ is more than ever before the way, the truth, and the life which lighteth every man that cometh into the world, healing all sorrow, sickness, and sin. To this auspicious Christmas tide, our hearts are kneeling humbly. We own his grace, reviving and healing. At this immortal hour, all human hate, pride, greed, lust should bow and declare Christ's power and the reign of truth and life divine should make man's being pure and blessed. At the start of the 20th century, Mary Baker Eddy was in constant demand to speak and write. And here's an excerpt from the New York World titled The Significance of Christmas. She wrote, the basis of Christmas is the rock, Christ Jesus, its fruits are inspiration and spiritual understanding of joy and rejoicing, not because of tradition, usage, or corporeal pleasures, 
but because of fundamental and demonstrable truth, because of the heaven within us. The basis of Christmas is love loving its enemies, returning good for evil, love that suffereth long and is kind. And this has special year, special meaning this year with the conflicts going on in the world. All of us are next in line as messengers of prophecy. The voice that spoke to so many over such a long period is speaking to us right now, revealing our ever-present Savior. As present-day Annas and Simeons, we have been called to our Bethlehem and to witness a new view of an old truth. Just as the angels announced to prophets gone before, it will announce to the hungry hearts everywhere the Christ appearing. Today's Bethlehem is in the heart of the West Bank, the heartbreaking war going on there in Gaza, as well as in Ukraine, calls for our prayers and the love that Jesus reminded us of in the new commandment he gave us, that we love one another as he loved us. We need only to ask how Jesus would have loved those engaged in the conflict and how to understand how we can love each other, including our enemies, this Christmas. I read the short article, I Love Christmas, to open this talk. Now there's nothing wrong with celebrating Christmas, so long as the reason underpinning the celebration honors the Bethlehem babe who heralded Christ to all of us, not just the early prophets. Christ comes to all. It speaks to all. Let's let it speak to us and everyone where it is most needed this Christmas. Reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, from Eugene Peterson's The Message. Every person the Father gives me eventually comes running to me. And once that person is with me, I hold on and don't let go. The Prince of Peace is calling all of us to Bethlehem. Run to the Christ within. All of us as today's messengers of prophecy of the Christ's presence which heals, saves, and ends wars is calling. Come. It is our turn to follow the star, allowing all to find salvation, drawn by an irresistible attraction to the Christ within, today, tomorrow, and every day of the year. Thank you all, and Merry Christmas.